Well, at the moment, yeah, because of distancing and so forth. Yeah. Apparently, we are going to start rehearsing. We're going to start rehearsing. I don't know whether we're going to start meeting as a whole choir. I thought we had more of a crowd today, but obviously not. Yeah. Huh. Singing to the greater congregation. Ethernet.
Thank you, Sean. Hello, and welcome to our service. We are the Rogue Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, or ROOF, in Ashland, Oregon. My name is Donna Barrett, and I'm a part of ROOF because I believe in our seven principles, especially the first, dignity for all, no matter what. This live stream service is the culmination of a lot of hard work allowing us to welcome you online and in person. We want to especially thank the members of the stream team who are learning the equipment and the process to make this happen. In the next few weeks, we will be increasing the number of you that can join us here in the Great Hall, but you will need to sign up for a spot. If you haven't joined the ROOF mailing list, now would be the time to go to rvuuf.org and do it. You will receive all the information you need to make your decision about whether you wish to join us on Sunday mornings in person or online. Thank you for your patience and care as we continue to learn to be both safe and inclusive in the ways we are together. We are so glad to have you with us for this service and we invite you to join us in our mission, embracing diversity, empowering connection, and engaging in the work. We begin each service by acknowledging that our building is built on land that began as the home of the Cow Creek Umpqua, Takelma, Shasta, and Lagawa people. We remind ourselves that indigenous people are part of our communities and continue to experience the effects of colonization and conquest. We are committed to fighting for the worth and dignity of indigenous people, both in our community and around the world. We are also committed to work for a world in which the lives, work, bodies, dreams, and leadership of black people are honored and respected. We do all this by putting our words, values, and principles into action every day for justice and the common good. These services are a part of that work. Welcome, and thank you for being with us. Hello, I am the Reverend John Parker Dennison, and it's my privilege and pleasure to serve as the minister here at Roof, and to add my welcome to Donna's. Thank you for being with us. We light our chalice the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, with words by Mark Bellatini. Ah, it's true. When our ancestors spoke of heaven, they were speaking of this moment. When they went on about nirvana, they imagined a time like this. When they sang of paradise, it was this morning they imagined. A time when all the mysteries of life and death are blended in a community of praise. When the bones of ancient lovers are given flesh again in our own bodies. Teachers of long ago speaking truth and love. Once more in lives so ordinary, they are extraordinary. Blessed is our breath in and out, quiet. Blessed is our sitting, our fidgeting, our movement. Blessed is our heartbeat echoing, the pounding alleluias of the distant stars. Blessed is the silence that is presence, not absence.
As part of our mission at Roof, we collect an extra offering on the first Sunday of the month for the Ashland Emergency Food Bank. The food bank has been in Ashland for 45 years and is adapting to this time of pandemic by creating outdoor shopping spaces for folks to gather the food that they need to make it through. As always, the food bank is accepting non-perishable and canned items to stock their shelves. But what they most need is cash donations so that they can provide all sorts of food to nourish people well and to keep them healthy. To donate to the Ashland Emergency Food Bank, send your check to Ashland Emergency Food Bank or AEFB at Post Office Box 3578, Ashland, Oregon 97520. Or you can donate at ashlandefb.org slash donations. Thank you so much for your generosity and your support. If you happen to bring uh, donations for the food bank and you're here in the Great Hall, there's a basket in the foyer for those donations. Today is a very special day because we have an opportunity to introduce you to our new intern minister, Pastor Kiana Denae Perkins, who will be serving all three congregations in the Southern Oregon UU Partnership, Klamath Falls, Grants Pass, and us here at Roof. This will be a hybrid internship, which means she will mostly be serving from her home in Michigan, but will join us in person at least three times. Kiana Dene, are you there? I'm here, I'm here. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. I, it's I great to see you. Yes, it's good to see you as well. Um, I am your new intern minister, intern, not in term, <laughs> uh, intern minister. My name is Kiana Denae Perkins, and I am so excited to be here. I want to share just a tiny bit about myself. I'm originally from Minnesota, but I currently live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I want to acknowledge that this is the land of the Potawatomi people that was also worked and shaped with brown and black labor. I am the co-parent of two teens who are absolutely amazing. Um, when I'm not driving them around Uber style, um, I like being outdoors. I like hiking, camping, and nature photography. Some of my experiences in UU have included connections with Black Lives of Unitarian Universalist, the Church of the Larger Fellowship, Side with Love, and UU the Vote. So, it, so I was the only one surprised when I heard the call to ministry. And although we were in a pandemic in 2021, I started at Star King School for the Ministry. I am delighted to be starting my second year as your intern minister. I will be working as Reverend Sean said, um, primarily here in Ann Arbor. However, I do get to visit three times a year. And my first visit is in 16 very short days. I'm not sure if you all had a chance to look at the newsletter, um, but I am looking for a couple of people to help me um, organize my visit um, and as well as some folks who are willing to help organize the worship for that Sunday. If you're able to help with those things, please, please, please give me an email um, at uh, the address is posted everywhere, but we'll post it in the chat. Um, and just know that in preparation for my visit, I will be hosting three listening circles the week of the 13th. Please look online or in your newsletter or weekly uh, communication that you get from, from the church for dates, times, and Zoom links. I am so excited to be here. Now that we have taken all the logistics out of the way, let us get settled in with our time together as led by Reverend Sean. Ashe and amen.
welcome to you and it's very exciting to have you as part of our fellowship for the next year. I invite you to join in singing together and our opening song is going to be Come, Come, Whoever You Are, words adapted from the poet Rumi. Uh, we are going to sing this as a round. We're going to be very adventurous. <laughs> so we'll sing it as a total of three times through. The first time we'll all sing it together and then the second time the pulpit side will begin first and then at my cue over on my side you'll come in second. So a total of three times together. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we sing. It has become our practice to light a candle each week for peace. We take this moment to call to mind our commitment to peace of mind, peace in our homes, peace in our communities, and peace in the world. Today's words are from the Seven Principles in Word and Worship, edited by Ellen Brandenburg. Our sixth principle seems extravagant in its hopefulness and improbable in its prospects. Can we continue to say we want world community, peace, liberty, and justice for all? The world is full of genocide, abuse, terror, and war. What have we gotten ourselves into? As naive or impossible as the sixth principle may seem, I'm not willing to give up on it. In the face of our culture's apathy and fear, I want to imagine and help create a powerful vision of peace by peaceful means, liberty by liberatory means, justice by just means. I want us to believe and to live as if we believe that a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all is possible. There is no guarantee that we will succeed, but I can assure you that we will improve ourselves and improve the world by trying.
This is the time in the service where I get to tell you a story. Today I don't have a story book, but I have a true story from our own history. It's called Muddy Children, the story of Hosea Ballou. It's adapted from Janine Grossmeyer in A Lamp in Every Corner, our Unitarian Universalist storybook. Over 200 years ago, in a small house, in a small town, on the edge of a forest of very big trees, in the state of New Hampshire, there lived a small boy. His name was Hosea Ballou. Hosea, just like other children, liked to learn and do new things. He was always asking questions about what and why and how. And just like other children, Hosea liked to play. He liked to play hide and seek and it, with his nine older brothers and sisters. He liked to play word games inside the house when it was rainy. And he liked to play tag outside when it was sunny. In the winter, he liked to jump into snow drifts. And in the summer, he liked to jump into the creek. And in the fall, he liked to jump into leaf piles. And in the spring, well, spring was Hosea's favorite season of all because in the spring, it would rain and rain and rain. And then Hosea could jump into mud. <laughs> Hosea loved mud. He liked it when it was soft and squishy, and he liked it when it was thick and sticky. He liked to make mud pies and to build mud dams. He liked to jump in puddles hard with both feet and make the muddy water splash really high so that the mud splattered all over his brother's and sister's clothes. And he loved to step in puddles very slowly so that the mud oozed up just a little bit at a time between his toes. Yes, Hosea loved mud. Now, you can imagine that not everybody in the family liked mud quite as much as Hosea did. His mother had died when he was not quite two, so his older sisters took care of him. His sister, who scrubbed the family's dirty clothes in big wash tubs, didn't like having to scrub all that mud off Hosea's clothes or off everybody else's clothes either after Hosea had stomped in a mud puddle extra hard. His other older sister, who kept all the little children clean, didn't like having to scrub all that mud off Hosea. And Hosea didn't even like having baths because it meant he had to stand in a wash tub in front of the fire and have water dumped over his head. But his sisters loved him, so they took him home and washed him and dried him and made him clean. Then Hosea's sisters went to their father and said, Father, please tell Hosea to stop playing in the mud. Hosea, said his father very sternly, you should not play in the mud. Why? asked Hosea, because asking questions was another thing he loved to do. Because, said his father, who was one of the preachers in the Baptist church the family went to, just as we try to live a good life, to be kind to other people and follow God's plan, we try to stay clean. Yes, Father, Hosea said, and after that day, he did indeed try to stay clean. But it wasn't easy. He stopped stomping in mud puddles on purpose and splashing the muddy water everywhere. And he stopped making those enormous mud pies. But sometimes the mud was just there. Then he had to walk through the mud to get across the yard to gather the eggs from the chickens. 
and he had to walk in the mud to feed the pigs. And sometimes when he was already muddy from doing his chores, he played in the mud just a little bit and got even muddier. His sisters who loved him took him home and washed him and dried him and made him all clean. But Hosea's sisters went to their father again and said, Father, please tell Hosea to stop playing in the mud. Hosea, his father said even more sternly, you must not play in the mud. Yes, Father, Hosea said. He was sad because he had truly tried to not get muddy most of the time anyway. Are you very angry with me, Father? I am disappointed in you, Hosea, and I am a little angry with you. Hosea hung his head and kicked the dirt with his toes. Then he dared to look up just a little to ask, do you still love me? Hosea, said his father, and his father didn't sound all that stern anymore. I will always love you, Hosea, no matter what you do. Even if I get muddy again? Yes. Even if I get really, really muddy? Yes. Even if I get mud all the way up to my eyebrows and between my fingers and my toes and in my hair? Even then, his, mother said with a, his father said with a smile. Then he added, very stern again, but remember, Hosea, you must try to stay clean. I'll remember, I'll try. Hosea promised, and he did. He stayed clean most of the time anyway. As he grew up, he stopped liking mud quite so much, but he still liked to ask questions about what and how and why. Father, Hosea asked when he was a teenager, how can it be that our church believes that God will only let one in a thousand people into heaven, even if many of those thousand people live good lives? His father didn't have an answer for that question. Hosea had to find his own answers. So he read the Bible, a book with many stories about religious people and about God. And he went to some universalist churches and asked more questions there. And at the age of 19, Hosea decided he believed in universalism, which is the idea that everyone everywhere, everyone in the universe will be given salvation Hosea Ballou believed God would eventually let everyone into heaven. How can you believe that? Asked his father. How can you believe that God would let everyone into heaven? Because, father, I remember what you told me when I was small. I believe that even if God is disappointed with people or a little angry with them, God will always love them and want them to be happy no matter what they do, no matter how muddy they are. Good morning. My name is Merrick Zimmerman. Today's reading is We Are Community by Elandria Williams in Becoming a Spiritual Guide for Navigating Adulthood. I came as a fourth grader to my congregation, the Tennessee Valley Unitarian Universalist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. This community helped bring me into social justice struggles in the world around me and inside the UUA. My church opened so many doors because they held young people in high esteem and encouraged our leadership in the church and community. My religious education teachers, friends, parents, and spirit aunts and uncles were and still are 
community leaders in everything from nuclear disarmament to anti-racism slash anti-oppression issues. They protested US military involvement in Central America and stood behind the parent of a classmate as she transitioned from male to female in the early 90s. They have been my inspiration as I work to support others who are called by their faith to change hearts, minds, and communities. My church changed forever on July 27, 2008, when an armed man came into the sanctuary and killed two UU leaders, one a member of our congregation and the other a member of Westside Church. This rocked our church to its core. When I first heard about it, I didn't know who had been killed, my mom, my friends and their parents, or others who had nurtured me my entire life. I realized something that day that has stayed with me ever since. No matter what issues I have with other Unitarian Universalists regarding our versions of God slash spirit, justice, race, and age, at the root of everything is community, love, and faith. That day, something larger than our individual beliefs rose up in my mind. I thought of the principles, values, and family that are the connective tissue of our faith community and that held us weeks after the shooting, six months later on our 60th anniversary, and still today. I am part of the connective tissue that holds the legacy and future of our, of our faith. I am Church Across the Street, AYS, YRUU, Youth Cons, Journey Toward Wholeness, The Mountain, and General Assembly Youth and Young Adult Caucus. We are the children of freedom fighters, visionaries, and radical liberal theologians. We are the phoenix rising out of the ashes of the McCarthy era and the civil rights, women's, and queer liberation movements. We are the survivors and beneficiaries of youth-led and youth-focused beliefs and programming that encourage us to be change makers, boundary pushers, and institutionalists at the same time. We are and will be the ministers, religious educators, congregational presidents, organizers, and social change leaders our faith has led us to be. We wear our faith as tattoos on our bodies and in our hearts as testaments to the blood, tears, dreams, and inspirations of our community ancestors and elders. I am to join together in singing the hymn, Do You Hear? Do you hear, oh my friends, do you hear? The lyrics will be on the screen. And please rise in body or spirit. Thank you for your beautiful singing. Will you join me for a time of centering 
in a spirit of meditation or prayer. These words are from Zen teacher Karen Mazin Miller. First, be quiet. Give away your ideas, your self-certainty, your judgments and opinions. Let go of defenses and offenses. Face your critics. They will always outnumber you. Lose all wars. All wars are lost to begin with. Abandon your authority and entitlements. Release your self-image, status, power, whatever thinks you think gives you clout. It doesn't. Not really. Give up your seat. See what you are un- guarded, a prisoner of no one or nothing. And now that you are free, see where you are. Observe what is needed. Do good quietly. If it's not done quietly, it's not good. Start over. Always start over. It's hard to believe it's Labor Day weekend. The start of the school year, a new month, and in some ways, a new year here at Roof. Summer drawing to a close, our multi-platform worship up and running. And we're at that time of year when we set new goals for the congregation, make new commitments, and move forward in our shared ministry. This year, our monthly themes are focusing on commitment. And for September, we're starting at the very beginning with our principles. Our reflection question this month is how do we live our commitment to our principles? It's exciting. Maybe a little bit nerve wracking to be here, finally. The pandemic felt so much like a pause button or a cliffhanger in our individual lives and in our congregational life. There was not even a month between your decision to call me as your settled minister and the first Sunday we were thrown into making videos and watching them from home. I remember oh, it'll, thinking, it'll only probably be a month or two and I'll just figure video production out on the fly our congregational goals, which we we're focused on learning together, had to be paused as we adapted to everything that was happening in the world and how it changed what we could do and how we got it done. And we learned how important it was as my few weeks expanded and expanded to pay attention to the middle part of our mission statement. The only way forward was to work as hard as we could to empower connection in new and innovative ways. We started by having our leadership tripod, that's the board, the minister, and the covenant committee meet every single week. They did that for a couple of months. We made an effort to contact every member in the congregation to see what they needed. We created two community care groups for those who wanted even more connection, and they still meet every week. 
We experimented with coffee hour on Zoom, creating a process where people could tell others how they're doing and offer their sacred attention as they listened to how others were doing. As so much changed, we actually did a good job of staying rooted in our principles. We centered the inherent worth and dignity of every person, the first principle, and the interdependent web that connects us to all, our seventh principle. And we used a whole lot of new means to continue our, to explore our commitment to those principles and all the others. If you need a reminder of what the principles are, and you're here in the Great Hall, they're right there on the wall. If you're joining us online, you can do a quick search for UU7 principles. There's a fancy, wordy version, or you can look for the simpler language principles. A few years ago, Reverend Meg Barnhouse wrote an article in the UU World called, Who Says Unitarian Universalism's Principles Are Easy? It was in response to people saying that UUs can believe whatever they want. Since the principles don't lay out doctrine, or sometimes people think they're easy, they're thin gruel, not asking much of us, and not therefore offering much either. She wrote this in response. My experience of the principles is that they are deeply demanding. The first one asked me to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, which means now I have to struggle with the worth and dignity of people who do unspeakably awful things, whereas the doctrine of total depravity made that one a no-brainer. I'm supposed to value the democratic process hearing the voice of everyone equally, allowing everyone to have a say. The UU principles are demanding enough to make me whine. For those who think, who feel they are thin gruel, I have a suggestion. Let's stick something onto the end of every principle that will stop people from smiling and nodding comfortably as they're read. Instead of adding in the bathtub or between the sheets, how about attaching beginning in our homes and congregations? Then we'd be faced with affirming things like the goal of peace, liberty, and justice for all beginning in our homes and congregations. Everyone who's raised children knows that peace is often at odds with liberty and that justice demands a disturbance of the peace. To put those three together in one principle is outrageous and lovely. It's easier to think about working towards them in a global context than in the context of Cheerios and pajamas, car keys, and cleaning one's bedroom. Justice, equality, and compassion in human relations beginning in our homes and congregations is a sobering ideal. I don't know about you, but I have sat in meetings about right relations and seen people get testy with one another. Some of the nastiest behavior I've ever seen was long ago at a community workshop for peace activists. <laughs> Lao Tzu, quoted in the back of our hymn book, says peace in the world begins with peace in the home, which begins with peace in the heart. If I start with my own heart, the demands of our principles get even heavier. Peace and compassion in my heart, justice too, freedom as well, affirming the worth of every person all the time, not only with my words and my behavior, but in my secret heart. For me, the heart of the liberal, liberal faith is to be connected to something greater than yourself to wallow in the spirit of life, love, and truth, to have fair trade coffee and important conversations, to stand for love and to stand against quibbling, complaining, and flouncing off in a huff, to move toward being in right relationship 
with ourselves, one another, and the planet. I agree with Reverend Barnhouse that our principles, if applied directly to our lives, are plenty demanding. So what does it look like to explore these principles, not as abstract ideals that we mainly hope will make others behave, but as real commitments we're making in our own hearts and homes and families, our congregation and community? What does it mean to actually live as if each and every person is important? Or that all people should be treated fairly and kindly? Or that our purpose at Roof is to accept one another and keep learning together? What will we do to ensure that each and every person is free to search what is, for what is true and right in their life? And to ensure that they should have a vote about things that concern them? How will we actually get to work building a peaceful, fair, and free world and caring for our planet Earth, the home we share with all living things? These are not small or easy questions at all. Yu Yu layperson Doug Muter wrote, the point of putting the principles in the front of the hymnal and teaching them to our children isn't to assert their truth or even to encourage you to nod along with the idea that they should be true. Unitarian Universalism is a commitment to envision a world in which the principles have become true. To envision it so intensely and in such detail that it becomes a genuine possibility and then join with others in making that possibility real. I like to imagine a world in which the principles have become true. But I'm also aware there's no magic way for it to happen. The principles are an invitation to become, as I often say at the end of my sermons, the ones who make it so. Our commitment to these principles means we are prepared and willing to arrange our lives around them. It means organizing our communities, our energy, our time, our money around these things. Mr. Muter ends his essay this way. That's how the seven principles turn into a challenging spiritual path. That's the key to me. Our principles aren't a list of rules or beliefs that somebody else is enforcing. These principles and our commitment to living them is the basis of a challenging, and I might add, interesting, rewarding, fulfilling, and even joyful spiritual path. I'm not preaching about the principles to make you feel guilty or pressured or cajoled into anything. I want you to consider that really committing to these principles is instead a way to have a life centered on the things that we most want to happen in this world. The pandemic pause taught me a lot about this. Mostly it taught me it's not just about individuals. It's about all of us making the commitment to become one version or iteration of the community we want to see happen. It's about caring about each other and being kind and making good decisions together and working for peace and justice and fairness right here and in the world. And it's about continuing to learn and grow and seek meaningful and relevant lives not out of duty, but because it's interesting and fun and it brings us joy. So as we take this month to look at our commitment to our principles, I want you to keep all of this in mind. It's not a set of rules to which, which you drudgingly follow. 
It's not an obligation. It's a way to explore what is possible and resist the isolation and despair that so often surrounds us. And we do that by creating and becoming a little world where the principles are real. We do that by centering our lives on what is good and putting down deep roots of community that will nourish and nurture us and everyone around us. May it be so. May we be the ones that make it so. Amen. Ashe. And blessed be. Each week, we take an offering that supports the mission and the work of this congregation. Since the pandemic, your generosity has been nearly the only source of financial support for the programs, services, outreach, and staff of our congregation. Your giving is immediately put to work putting our principles into action in this community and beyond. If you are here in the Great Hall, there's a basket in the foyer where you can make your gift, or you can give in one of the following ways. You can give by sending a check to Ruth, 87 4th Street, Ashland, Oregon, 97520. Or you can give online at tinyurl.com slash roofoffering or by using your phone to scan this QR code. You can give by sending a text to 541-229-4229. Please text the amount of your gift with a dollar sign. For example, dollar sign 50 for $50. If you need support, please contact Reverend Sean using the form on roof.org. We will do our best to help. For these gifts which support us in doing the work of our mission and for all the gifts you bring into this world, thank you. Our closing song this morning has plenty of rhythm and energy and I invite you to throw yourself into the spirit of when the spirit says do. Please rise in body or spirit.
great job. Our closing words are the last lines from Meg's, Meg Barnass's article about our principles in the UU world. For me, she says, this faith isn't a thin gruel. It's not even a rich and hearty gruel. It's walnuts and bananas and pancakes and mangoes and arugula and ginger and avocado. This feast is prepared with effort, enjoyment, persistence, and commitment. Care to join me? Thank mm -hmm. you.